One of the main ways that the general public interacts with volcanoes is through news and media. And how effective that communication is depends on accurate, reliable and interesting journalism. Whether that's from the worrisome, to the wonderful, to the downright weird side of volcanoes. And so I'm very excited today to be joined by Dr. Robin Andrews, science journalist, popular science author and volcanologist. Hi, Robin. Hey, Sam. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Yep, good to see you as well. Now, thank you so much for joining us today. Like I just said, journalism is such an important part of anything to do with vol- not just volcanoes, but natural hazards and science in general, because it's the main way that people come face to face with it, even if it's just through their TV screen, through their phone, through the newspaper. And it's just such a critical part. So I'm so glad to be able to talk to you about this today. Oh, good to talk about it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> So as a great way to start this off, it would be good to know a bit more about your your background and how you've got to where you are today, because you started your journey in from more of an academic side of thing, but you found yourself thrown into the world of journalism. Yeah, so I don't so I don't have any journalism training. And journalism was not something that like came up at any point during my my uh you know, multi-decadal quest to become a volcanologist because I was I didn't really have a very concrete plan I was inspired by volcanoes and video games and some very supportive geography teachers basically to to do volcanology because I just thought you know there aren't any volcanoes in the UK so it means you get to go to interesting places and study these exploding mountains but academia wasn't really for me just because I was I'm quite an impatient person and as much as I love doing aspects of the PhD, I kind of learned that I prefer telling non-scientists about volcanoes rather than just focusing on like one thing to do and worrying about grant money and stuff like that. I just wasn't very good at that. And I hated writing academic papers. I hated it because I every now and then I put in like a bit of flowery language to just try and just make the text seem a bit less flat, even though I understand why it's supposed to be, you know, very, very to the point. And I, my supervisor was always like, no, stop it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> slapping my hand out of the way, metaphorically. And uh, it was just like, oh, OK. So I kind of just winged writing like random blog posts and things. And just one thing led to another. And eventually I got to be a full time science, a freelance science journalist, which is still a weird thing because it was completely improvised on the spot. There was no grand plan to do it. It was just like, oh, I really enjoy this. I'm going to keep doing this and see if I can make a living out of it. And that was all the plan I had. So thanks, editors, (laughs) for for letting me write about stuff. And probably not something that you'd recognized as a viable career at coming, uh, you know, finishing up a PhD and doing like straight up volcanology. Yeah, no one at any point, in any way mentioned that this was a possibility basically it was that kind of as i'm sure a lot of phd students are familiar with is the idea of like you're doing a phd you obviously have to you're on the ladder now you're on the you're down this kind of labyrinth of you have to get to the center of the maze and you have to keep going and anything else was kind of broadly considered as like a failure of some sort you know there was this like well you know it's the publish and perish thing and all the other kind of stuff that comes up with that. And I'm amazed that the persistence of people kind of get through that. And I know some people have harder times than other sort of thing, but it was, yeah, I mean, my supervisor and his colleagues and everything were just sort of like, what else would you do? Like, why would you do this if you didn't do, want to be in academia sort of thing? And I was, so you kind of have to make it up. Like, who do you talk to? What, the, yeah. what happens? There was, there was no really advice given. So it was just kind of fluky, really. You know. So how did you even find yourself in, you know, that very first writing gig, so to uh, speak? Uh, how, how, how were you discovered? I, I was like, discovered. <laughs> I mean, it took a little while. It, it took a little while because I started writing just random blog posts just for the just for the fun of it during the PhD. So I just wanted to write something that wasn't just academic text. And, um, and I think, like, after my PhD, there was a sort of year of, like, well, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> kind of thing, you know, how does this work? Um, but eventually, um, I just sort of sort of aggressively emailed a few outlets like Gizmodo and Nat Geo and was like, hey, you should let me write about this thing. <laughs> because this <laughs> stuff about Yellowstone is crazy and silly. 
And this is more interesting than that. And I think just just by saying, hey, I'm, I have a PhD in volcanology and I, I think I can write, you know, <laughs> about it. They just were kind enough to give me a chance sort of thing. So, you know, and once you get in somewhere and you don't mess it up, you can kind of build off that because you can send out mm. from places like, hey, I, I wrote about this for Gizmodo and I wrote about this for Nat Geo. And then it kind of, it, then it accelerated wildly out of control. So like in 2018. So it, I've only really been doing this full time for three and a bit years. Um, but it sort of, one, it, once it started going well, it just kept, it didn't stop, which I'm very thankful for. But yeah, it yeah, took a while to get to that. Because I think I remember like seeing some more of these journals coming out exactly around that time, mm. and they just kept coming like at a faster, faster pace. It was like a train setting off from the station, <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden, like my Facebook feed was full of these wonderful, volca- well-written vol- volcano articles. It was brilliant. Uh, it was good. It's good fun, and it's nice because it's quite a niche. Like there aren't many people that are very. I can only think of one other journalist that kind of regularly writes. Okay, maybe two that regularly writes like geo themed pieces even though they can write about other things um one is paul at uh, vusen at science uh, and maya very high set nat geo and mm. kind of a different focuses sort of thing but it is nice that when a volcano erupts or does something interesting all my editors sort of look at me like well mm, <laughs> you know yeah and it's so it's nice to have the expectation that i'll write about something so i think that's the point i was like okay maybe i'm not terrible at this i think but yeah it took a while we all have imposter and, syndrome. <laughs> and then for you coming in, say, from a science background, that must have mm. put you in a very different place to the majority of people involved in journalism. Like you said um, not long ago, your background is not in journalism, but a lot of people are. Did you find that that was, you know, your ne- your unique twist? Because you can say, as you just said, I have a PhD in this subject. Mm. I can give you that, that. I can tell you what information is accurate here, what is not. What is fear mongering? What's misinformation? And what's interesting and engaging from it? Yeah, that definitely helps. I mean, I think the best way to describe it, like science is, science is a good way of, especially if you've gone through to do like, well, I don't have to do a PhD, but if you've gone through and done a science degree of any sort, it's a good way of kind of teaching you how to recognize bullshit from reality. <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of come to the understanding that just because something's peer reviewed in a journal doesn't mean it's necessarily good in that way sort of thing you know and you kind of helps you read scientific papers so you can read and get stories out of things that people might be like i've no idea what that means and you're sort of like what but this means this and it's you know um it's nice as well when you talk to scientists you don't have to there's an expectation that you kind of know the basics so you don't have to start with like so what is magma what's the difference between magma and lava and stuff like that but that definitely helps but i think the other thing that my editors pointed out often was that I always seem quite gleeful. And I know, obviously, you have to be sensitive for certain subjects, but volcanoes are generally considered to be, like, ominous, doomy mountains. But I was like, but sometimes they're just, they're just cool. They just do cool things. And I think that that has... I think that was a... That hadn't come across before to a lot of them. This kind mm. of gleeful, like, thing of explosions and lava <laughs> and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, okay. I just always thought they were. <laughs> so, yeah, enthusiasm, I guess. <laughs> and so, well, one thing you could say is that volcanoes say they're cool, but they're also super. Not yes. as in super volcanoes, <laughs> but as in your book, <laughs> Super Volcanoes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, there the it is works. right there. The title, I mean, like, I have received two, ang- two um, only two, angry emails from people going, well, this whole book wasn't about... Yellowstone like world ending blah and they, someone just said there's not enough death in your book and I was like okay I mean I <laughs> I there have been some popular science books on volcanoes and they're good but they're often about things that have been destructive and I was like I want to write a book about just like the cool things volcano there's a little bit of destruction in there but mostly it's like look how cool this stuff is there's no you know look how important this is how they help us understand entire worlds and everything so they're volcanoes that are super but I felt like I shouldn't spell that out very explicitly in the book because I thought most people would get that. Most people do, but two yeah. people apparently have not. <laughs> so I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that, Rachel. There we go. Yeah. The, yeah. the, the, the general the general public has decided it's, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's 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 a really fantastic book. Um, oh, there's so. there's just so much in there in terms of the topics you go through, the the people that you talk to, and then just your approach 
to the, the subject and just the writing itself, it makes it engaging and not feel like I'm reading, you know, a science textbook, which that, is yeah. probably exactly what the aim is. Yeah, I wanted it to be a book that was mainly about stories than just like a science explainer thing. There is obviously science in there, but it's not like, here is how these work. It's more like, look at the look at the kind of stories you get from the people who study these things. You know, that's what really interests me. Like when we first, when we first spoke for that article in 2019, I think so. Seems yeah. like ages ago. Um, your expedition to kind of help image like the the, the magma within a, an underwater volcano, and I was like, it just it's the sort of stuff that's like it's it's adventurous but true, um, you know. So I think it's it's kind of that, that really appeals to me. So that's what I was going for. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, so, yeah. Sometimes you get these events. I guess that uh, it's not just a volcanic eruption that almost plays out by the textbook and by mm. the playbook how it's mm. it's meant to happen but mm. sometimes you get you know certain ventures or expeditions that come about that aren't necessarily related to an eruption but to mm -hmm. a volcano mm -hmm. where you can tell the story of the scientists and the story of the journey mm. yeah. as well the, the, the very human side and exploratory side of it yeah and the human side is just as interesting to me as all the kind of science behind it because it's so, they aren't they incredible things you know they're incredible things to study volcano sort of thing they're just so fantastical in the sense that they really don't seem real when you hear stories about them what they can do and you know i don't know it just there's such a compelling element to me like liquid fire you know it just seems it seems self-evident that they need to be written about <laughs> but the people yeah. that study them are also fantastic too so it's a good combination and there's and unlike something like hurricanes like no one they can be fascinating but generally like everyone's like oh no Oh, bad. Hurricanes are bad. You don't want those coming your way, sort of thing. And earthquakes, terrible. They're, you know, someone said that volcanoes at least give you some warning, but earthquakes are bastards, I think. That's what they said. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, volcanoes can be destructive, right? But for the most yeah. part, they're just great. <laughs> they just do their thing. They're amazing to look at. They foster cultures and societies and change planets. What else does that? Uh, Hurricane yeah. doesn't do that. <laughs> as, uh, as you say, when it comes to, you know, ap approaching this and that, that that balance, you get events sometimes that happen around the world that have no, you know, cultural, societal, even, mm. even very little environmental impacts that you can then just go and view them or see the images and like that, that's it. Mm -hmm. There's no thoughts of oh I you know I need to consider that this is um, affecting people this is having an impact on someone's lives and w those events are probably quite a breath of fresh air mm. for for journalists and scientists yeah yeah I because, think so yeah because you can just talk about as you say the cool aspect of it yeah and just uh, what the science we can learn from this and if it's you know somewhere like recently um, in Iceland at Fagradestral mm -hmm. where people can just go yeah, it's up to it. Incredible, <laughs> like uh, honestly, it, that it, it's one of those things, that was such a perfect like eruption because it just shows you what long term monitoring and understanding of a sort of vol of a volcanic region can do when it comes to these eruptions. Like at no point there was some nerves, that, you know, that all oh, if, if it comes out too close to Grindavik, I think the town I was in the south mm. something. But when it started erupting, everyone's like, it's just kind of interesting. Like people just set up camp around it, gigs, wedding proposals. It's great. That's that's yeah. what volcanoes do a lot of the time. But there's that bias, isn't there, that they make the sort of general news when they do something destructive. So that's the image people have in their heads generally, whereas often they just do things and it's fine and everyone gets on with their life sort of thing. So, yeah, you know. And cool. then as and then recently, as of only, I think, a couple of months ago, mm. you know, normally you're writing articles about events or eruptions are happening, but sometimes you get the opportunity to take a step back and think about, you know, the social effects of this. So you wrote a really interesting, and I'm, I'm so glad you wrote this article about the paradox mm. between yeah. <laughs> finding this stuff cool and interesting, but also, you know, that balance of considering, you know, the, the ethical well, balance that you have to have. Yeah. When when discussing these things, if they have had an impact on people's lives. I'm just wondering what like came about for you to decide to, you know, write that article. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. One was the when I was writing about I wrote lots about the twenty eighteen Kilauea, you know, eruptive sequence sort of thing. And that was amazing and devastating in so many ways. And I it was you know, there was like lava nados. I know they were technically 
like fire worlds or whatever. <laughs> they were lava natives. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you had like blue fire and you had these like giant boob- billowing clouds and these spectacular lava fountains. But you also had hundreds of homes destroyed um, and, you know, lots of hearts broken as a result of that. And it was, I, it was so interesting talking to volcanoes there, either it, who are already in America or who are elsewhere. And for a lot of younger volcanologists, this was the first time they'd ever seen an eruption like this kind of thing, you know, not even not actually yeah. a lot to a lot of volcanologists that never seen an eruption quite like this sort of thing. And it was just funny hearing them oscillate within minutes from absolute joy of like, Oh my God, this is, Everything I've wanted to see in my entire life, you know, the first time you see lava anyway for anyone is like a transcendent experience. It's so strange and ominous, but awe-inspiring, you know. And then minutes later, they pivot to just how distressing it was when people coming up to them talking about, is this lava going to destroy my home? You know, watching home get destroyed the next day and that horrible kind of side of things. And, and, so that was in the back of my head. And then there was the La Palma eruption that was going on. And I saw some scientists on Twitter, some volcanologists on Twitter, especially, again, younger ones, go to La Palma and be like, this is amazing. I've never seen anything like this. Here's like a lava bomb, like rolling down the thing, like Sonic the Hedgehog kind of thing. And then some people are like, it's disrespectful to be that excited, you know, people's homes being lost. And I kind of felt bad for the scientists because... I don't think anyone was there with like a malicious intent. Like, yeah, screw these people. It was just this natural, like, you know, this focus on this thing you've been selling and actually seeing this process. And I kind of wanted to write something that was like, I'm pretty sure volcanologists feel both of these things. And there aren't many things in life where you feel like awe and horror at the same time. It's a weird thing. Like you can, you can within a second jump back and forth, you know? Um, Yeah. Like it's you, absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You get you get that initial rush of like wow, which is just a visceral reaction, and then once the social aspect sort of filters in, you're like, oh, this can actually be terrible. But it doesn't mean it's one or the other; it's both. And I think there's, there's always yeah. this need on like social media to be like, it's one or the other. It has to be one or the other. You know, it's like the whole we either go into space or we fix Earth. It's just like it's just crap. Like it's. You can do both these things or feel both these things. So that's why I, I really wanted to write that. So I'm glad my editor let me write it because it was just something mm. that I feel like almost every volcanologist has at some point experienced that. So I'm glad it resonated anyway. Yeah. And it, it's important as well for, you know, for, for the volcanologist to, so that that story is heard and also for public perceptions of volcanologists mm. and well, not just volcanologists, but scientists, right. first responders, if anyone who's involved in these kinds of or geohazard events in general, mm. um, so that people understand it's like, no, we, we are seeing both sides of this, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but if we're on the ground as scientists, you know, collecting data, analyzing samples, mm. uh, that is where our minds are going to be sometimes. Yeah. But within a second, then, you know, people might be helping out with first responders and um, yeah. answering messages from people, particularly yeah. if they're down on the scene. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, people are, humans are complex, you know. We don't just have, we don't have a bit, an ability to just feel one thing <laughs> sort of thing. Yeah. It's You go for a range of emotions, you know, it's it, with anything in life. So, you know, when you're faced with something so otherworldly as an eruption that most of us fortunately don't have to stare down every day, you know. It's not like a common thing, even for volcanology. You don't spend your entire life just right next to these things. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it needed to be un, unspooled a bit, I think, as you say, because there yeah. was that, you know, it's it's good to have an insight. Like, the, the people are, scientists are human too. <laughs> you know, they're not, <laughs> they're not just sort of unemotional logic machines. They're definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> But so coming back to your book a second, I'm now wondering at the, you know, the transition that mm. came about from you going, you know, from more popular science article writing for like Nat Geo, Gizmodo, the New York Times, mm. to then deciding not all of these things I've I've done over these few years, I want to put this into a book. What mm. was that spark? Um, I mean, so I, I'd always had the idea that I wanted to write something like the book that eventually came out because there were so many grand tales of, adventure and intrigue and explosivity you know and i was like this definitely is crazy stories in it like every now and then someone would tell me something off just like 
oh, once Mars tipped over by 20 degrees. And I was just like, that's nuts. Like, this is the sort of thing that, like, why isn't this told to, like, students everywhere, you know, that volcanoes can do this indirectly sort of thing. It's just, anyway, it was stuff like that. And I kept, I just thought, I'm just going to store all this in my head. But it was kind of a fluke because I wrote, just for no apparent reason, I wrote an article that had nothing to do with volcanoes for the Atlantic. It was about dark matter and ancient shipwrecks, just completely randomly. Um, and just agents popped out of nowhere to be like, hey, have you ever thought of writing a book? And I just picked one. who seemed nice. <laughs> and just and he's like, okay, we'll put together this proposal and... He's like, what do you want to write about? I was like, S- S- there are volcanoes in space and they're cool. And they're right. I, I, you know, I hadn't thought of the idea properly, but it was kind of just like an organic thing that just kind of came out of nowhere. So that was like, so within six months, I had this proposal written up, sent off. And then fortunately it was accepted, you know? Um, and it was, so it kind of came about, I didn't pursue it. It was kind of pursued as a result of someone seeing something I'd written. So that was very, really nice actually, but it was so like a book I was selling, I was like, oh, in 10 years, maybe I'll get to write one. So it was crazy that within, it was the first uh, the first year of me freelancing full time that came up. And I was just like, I, I cannot believe that this is happening. So, yeah, it was kind of a fluke, actually. Yeah. It's so and weird. Actually, and you say it came about from non volcano related <laughs> yeah. articles. Yeah, <laughs> it was because the article had a sort of narrative to it. And I think it, it kind of hinted that I could tell stories rather than yeah. just like, here's how a thing works. So I think that's what did it. But yeah, it was really funny because it was on dark matter. And I really don't write about dark matter much, but it was, <laughs> I like writing about weird stuff. <laughs> stuff that makes people go, oh, that's cool. And that- I, I was going, I was going to say, how do you find that transition, you know, going from something that you don't know as much about because you suddenly yeah. have to do a, probably a lot more research you do, yeah. as, as opposed to when the volcanic eruption happens, you go, okay, I know who I want to speak to. I know the good background of this and I can do a lot of this myself. Yeah. 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 It's a lot more difficult to, to, when it, when something like that comes up, I'm just like, I, uh, I don't know who I'm going to speak to initially and I have to make double check, triple check that I've, what I'm saying is right and stuff with volcanoes. It's kind of all the fundamentals are very clear and it's a lot like I never worry about writing an article about volcanoes, but if it's something on dark matter, I'm always like, I enjoy it, <laughs> but it's always like, Oh, you know, <laughs> like does this make, I feel kind of silly asking really basic questions, but I'm like, I, I need to know if I if I say this, is it okay sort of thing. But, yeah. Yeah. but the basic questions that you're asking are probably the basic questions that someone from the general public would also want to ask. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. I mean, I just <laughs> I just act as like lame and, and as possible. Even if I have some background, like, oh, I know what an axiom is or something. I'm just like, nope, I'm just going to pretend I know nothing. So they have to explain it in the most like straightforward way kind of possible because they need to translate it for me sort of thing so it's still fun though i like it no it's it's nice to write about different things but volcanoes and and planets and things are still my favorite like things with rocks doing kinetic things (laughs) (laughs) and the the net the network of people you must now have from not just from volcanoes but from talking about all kinds of topics that you Mm. know you can go back to as reliable sources Mm -hmm. or maybe not so reliable sources (laughs) uh it's normally reliable yeah there have only been a few people i've spoken to and it's just been like there's like openly hostile like why are you asking that or you should know that you're a volcanologist by training and just like you know just a very very like literally on one hand count those people but like hundreds i've spoken to hundreds of people and everyone is normally great and really great science communicators, you know, um, mm. especially like younger scientists that are very good at communicating what they do. And I think there's a much more savvy approach to like how you explain stuff to people who aren't scientists, whereas sometimes you get like older uh, scientists who just almost don't care. That they don't even care if sometimes like if they if if they explain it in a way that you understand, it's like, well, pff, this is how I explain it. So deal with it Mm. kind of thing so the most entertaining (laughs) interviews are from like you know younger cohorts on average sort of thing you know so yeah that's interesting so you know this this career comes with its challenges certainly and you you know you've just mentioned a couple there is there anything that really sticks in in mind of as you know as a, a challenge in science journalism um every now and then you meet an editor you think i'm 
oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> like, you know, a really good editor. Okay. I, I'm the editors I've got now are just so good. Like, they are so lovely. And I'm not just saying that. They are just so thoughtful and considerate. Any criticism is always constructive. And they always ensure that your voice is kept in. They don't try and, like, neuter your language. Um, and they suggest ideas and you can talk through them. And it's very, like, informal and great. I, you know, love all my editors. But uh, early on, I came across, like, a couple that I was like, I, I just... This person's just trying to, but it's just like they're writing this article and, and you know, they're like, you have mm. to include the source. And I'm like, no, it's not going to be good. And then you, you know, you feel like you're being railroaded to do things that you like. I don't, this person doesn't seem to understand the point of what I was trying to pitch and very, very rare examples. But once you know, like, oh no, that's not good. Early on when you haven't, you don't feel like you've got that much of a reputation. You, you feel like you have to just work with people that you don't really one who kind of thing just to build it up but now if someone is it's a, a story comes up i'm like oh it might be a good for that editor but i'm like i don't like that editor you know um or i don't really feel like it then i, I feel like i don't have i don't have to do it now so early on that yep. was definitely a a challenge sort of thing and uh but now it's just like i've got the best group of editors science editors like i've i could possibly want so it's it's good but that does take a while to work out like who do you work best with and who isn't just like a megalomaniac kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but then I guess also the demands on your own time as well. This is not a nine Monday to Friday, nine to five <laughs> kind of job. As much as you yeah. you could attempt to shoehorn it, because when yeah. a, an eruption happens, you must have a split second of thinking, oh, wow, this has happened. That's cool. Mm. To a few seconds later, like going, okay, three, two, one. Now I've got to start writing yeah. and talking to people. <laughs> yeah, it's been a bit easier during the pandemic because there's less, there's less social stuff going on. So you just think, ah, mm. it doesn't really matter when it happens sort of thing. Um, I'm also like, all my editors are in, in America. Almost all of them are in America. So my time zone is normally East Coast. But I'm a night owl anyway. So a lot of that's fine. And I'm quite like improvisational as a person and spontaneous. So like, it's not a job that suits someone who likes rigorous planning of, of, and scheduling. <laughs> You have to think on your feet all the time, like constantly. And like some de- some weeks are like really quiet and then like something crazy happens. And then like the recent Tonga eruption, that was just like 14 full days of just constant writing yeah. and interviews and research. I think I wrote six different things on that one eruption sort of thing. And, and it was just like all on very different aspects. And there's so much going on. It was evolving in real time, but it was kind of like, fun, like that's what I do. It's good. But, but you know it's kind of unsustainable to keep doing that you need to have a, a time off to just go like Ugh. but sometimes it's it ebbs and flows quite dramatically but overall it kind of balances out but yeah trying to like you know now that <laughs> before omicron when social things started to happen again my brain was just like all i want to do is just see people like <laughs> but i need to switch that balance and it's quite an extreme like all of the work and then all of the play. It's, it, I can't really think of a time where it's been like, oh, it's a nice balance of stuff. I'm just confused <laughs> when it's like, oh, it's weirdly, this is just acting like a normal week. I don't understand. So, yeah, it's, so it's, as long it's as chaos. People, as long as people know that going in. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty chaotic. It's not like, when you have a quiet moment, like, enjoy it because it suddenly won't be quiet at some point sort of thing. So, yep. it's like, yeah, you have to think on your feet a lot. But if you don't mind that, it's so exciting. I, I remember I was up in the, the Arctic just on a like a fun... I was invited to attend something that was about the Aurora, and it wasn't for a reporting thing. It was just like... It was kind of like a draw. Um, and like, hey, we can get people up to talk about the Aurora from like all different backgrounds. And whilst I was up there, there's a really cool study that came out but an asteroid that could blow itself if you blew it up with a nuke it reassemble under its own gravity like the liquid terminator kind of thing it's like oh my god i really want to write that so i pitched it while standing on a frozen lake at like one in the morning <laughs> and then ran back to my hostel to write it and then went and then like just stayed up all night writing it and then just went snowmobiling the next morning sort of thing and i remember being like oh, i am exhausted but i'm so exhilarated that i could just do this stuff like in the art like it's what a crazy place to write this thing up and I just remember it so vividly because it was such a weird, you know, and I remember thinking, this this is what I want to do forever. <laughs> it's this. <laughs> uh, it's just crazy. So, um, yeah, it suits, if you can improvise, then yeah, you just need the internet, basically. 
So yeah. <laughs> so you, you've mentioned a few things there, but is there anything else you know you would say to someone considering you know science journalism, mm. popular science writing as a possible career? Yeah, two things. One is like, please give it a chance sooner rather than later, because things get harder to do once you go through life later. And I remember thinking like, you know, should I try this now or should I just like, I, basically I gave myself like a year to to just try and make it okay sort of thing. And, I, and things fortunately went much better than I thought they would. But I, you know, I, I still felt like, I give yourself like a year to give it a go. Unless you're going to be like homeless and starving, just give it a go when you feel like you should. Because as this pandemic has really emphasized, life can be very short and you will regret things in five years time if you think, damn, if I only gave it a shot, you know, if it doesn't work out, then OK. But like, at least, you know, at least you gave it a try. The other thing is reach out to uh, journalists for advice, um, mm. because most journalists are very happy to chat to you. Some are kind of closed off, but most science journalists I spoke to are happy to be like, yeah, and you can. Here's this person's email. Why don't you pitch them? You can say I recommended you kind of thing. Like, I owe a fair bit to, um, she used to write at uh, Gizmodo, and she founded Eartha, but she's moved on as a freelancer herself now, as um, Maddie uh, Stone, and she just gave me a chance really early on, just because I just simply, and I wasn't even looking at the time, I just said, hey, your articles are great, one day I hope to write articles like this kind of thing. She said, oh, why don't you try pitch to Gizmodo, kind of, you know, you, you seem like you know what you're doing, and help me write like understand how features are written and how news articles are written. So, you know, just be nice to writers and they'll be happy to give some time up to help. Like I would never pay, like I, I'd always give people advice for free because it's, it's often the people that need the advice haven't are just getting started. So I wouldn't like be like, yeah. yes, give me money. But it's yeah. I, so reach out to writers and just dare to give things a go. Like just practice writing or telling stories that you're passionate about. Like, don't do something you don't want to do. Someone's like, oh, science journalism, you have to write about all kinds of things. Like, I'd never write about, like, genetics. I'd never do it because I'm just not an expert in that and it would be so nerve-wracking and awful. Um, so just practice writing what you enjoy telling stories about and speak to writers and just see how things go, you know. It's, you'll regret it otherwise, <laughs> I think. Good. I, I think that's a sell if I've ever heard it. <laughs> <laughs> now, so you, you talked about, you know, standing in the middle of a frozen lake and thinking up of an article about mm. how, you know, asteroids can <laughs> reassemble themselves. Yeah. But apart from that, <laughs> do you have a particular memory or a moment that sticks in your mind, you know, related to, you know, your life in volcanoes? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's... The, it, it's it's bef it's while I was in the middle of my PhD and it was the moment I was like, okay, this is exactly the feeling I want to feel as in a career sort of thing. And it's when I took my parents to see Stromboli erupt. Um, and my parents, are, I fortunately, uh, you know, have very supportive parents. They've always said like, do what you are passionate about kind of thing. And just, you know, we'll just see how it goes and things. And I always had this interest in like volcanoes and that. But when I, it was halfway through my PhD and we met in Sicily and I took them to see Stromboli erupted and it was the first time they'd ever seen like lava before their eyes sort of thing. And they were so bowled away by it. Like it really was the seeing is believing just to be like, this is what I want to do kind of thing. And actually showing someone, and especially two people that mean a lot to me, like how volcanoes can make you feel kind of thing, mm. that kind of awe when they're not causing any harm. I remember being like, that's the feeling I want to engender in other people all the time that means more to me than just kind of trying to understand volcanoes myself i would rather hear about it from other people but giving a sense of people because there's enough misery and crap in the world as it is giving people a moment of like wow that's cool just was like that's what i want to do somehow that and i think that, that that was a formative moment and i always think about that fondly nowadays when i'm doing this exactly what i hoped I would just beyond my expectations or things. So yeah, that, that I think about that a lot. Brilliant. That's that, that's a perfect, perfect way to wrap this up. I feel <laughs> as much as we could keep talking about many things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, if, if you are interested in reading some uh, of Robin's work, um, it's the best place, probably your, your website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah just so, Robin George Andrews.com. So uh, yep. got there before then, someone yep. else did. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's a great place just to basically find the majority of it. I mean, you've written so many at this point now. How do you even keep them documented? But the most recent one, so if there is, you know, an upcoming vault, well, I say upcoming, if there's not an upcoming volcanic <laughs> that's, event. That's a secret right? project I'm working on, yeah. <laughs> but if there's been a volcanic event, a recent eruption that you might have seen um, in the news, I would encourage you to... Th- uh, look out for Robin's work because no doubt within a day or two following some event there will be an article <laughs> yeah pretty much sometimes on the day if it's uh, depending on the time zone <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for joining us today Robin I really appreciate it and hopefully that's given people a, an interesting insight into another way that you know people can interact with volcanoes and also a different careers that people might be able to have if they're interested in in this area Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Sam. And yeah, people can reach out to me in chat if they want as well. Just send me an email or tweet at me or something like that. You know, always happy to speak. Yep, you can find him at Squiggly Volcano. (laughs) I've got to to ask before, this is the last point now, Squiggly Volcano, where's that come from? (laughs) Yeah, so I didn't have, I got Twitter in 2011. I didn't really see the point of it until, (laughs) you know, when all those revolutions were happening and sort of the middle east and you could get updates on twitter kind of thing i was like oh i get Mm. i get why twitter's a thing but i didn't really get it until i went to see a show with brian cox the physicist and dara brian and they said oh if you tweet us questions during this thing we can answer them on stage and i just Mm. panicked and set up a twitter account in the break and uh for some reason (laughs) the handle was just squiggly volcano i was i don't know where it came from but it had to have volcano in it and squiggly is a silly word so it just kind of fits. And now I get a little bit of joy every time like somewhere very serious like the New York Times goes, and now for this very serious article by Squiggly Volcano. And it's, it's kind of funny. <laughs> I love it. That That is not what I was expecting whatsoever, but that is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so on that note, I'll now again say thank you. Um, thank you for joining us. <laughs> it's been a really great chat. Thanks. Good, good to be here, Sam. <laughs>